fantastic show coming up. We do. Are you excited? We do. We are all excited. We've all been looking forward to it. Yes. We have a lot of guests here today, Paolo. We have four classes from the Mindanao Peace Building Institute with us. And give a little cheer, folks, when I name your class. We are being hosted by the Conflict Resolution Skills class. We also have the Asian Faces of Justice. We have the Strengthening Peace Education course. invitation folks and we are glad that you've accepted our invitation and shown up to speak in peace. So Mike, I turn it over to you now. Please introduce our first guest for us. Yes, Wendy. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest is from the University of the Philippines, a political science professor um, and her expertise is easily reflected in her list of credentials that revolves around conflict resolution and transitional justice. Miriam Coronel Ferrer was involved in the international campaign to ban landmines, which won the Nobel Peace Prize. She also co-founded the Philippine Campaign in 1995. She joined the international fact-finding missions investigating violence in Cambodia and human rights violations in East Timor and Nepal. Miriam Ferrer was also one of the 27 Filipino women included in the initiative to nominate 1,000 women for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2005. Her rich academic background boasts of graduate cum laude at the University of the Philippines in Diliman with a degree in AD philosophy, taking up an MA in Southeast Asian Studies at the University of Kent at Canterbury in the United Kingdom. Today, her pursuit of knowledge continues as she currently takes up a University of Helsinki PhD program in political science while shuffling her roles as wife, mother, professor, negotiator, woman activist, and peace advocate. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for the chief negotiator of the government peace fund. Thank you so much. So, uh, welcome again, uh, Miriam, to the uh, Speaking Peace show this morning. We are very thankful to you for taking time out of your busy schedule. We know you're a very busy lady, uh, and so we'd like to thank you for taking time out to be here with us. We have all been looking forward to, uh, to this. Uh, particularly from the class of the conflict resolution uh, class that have just started to talk about negotiation today. So we're all looking forward to your sharing of your experiences and your stories today. My pleasure to be here with all the peace builders of the world. Uh, it's a good it's a great opportunity to be here. So let's begin, Miriam, by uh, you sharing with us uh, when you were first appointed as chief negotiator for the uh, GBH panel and the first woman in that. How did you feel? What was running through your mind? And how did you prepare for the task? Well, I was a member of the panel way back in uh, July 2010 when the new president came in. Uh, and so I was already inside the group. And when the chair was appointed, to the Supreme Court as Associate Justice and uh, there were some uh, difficulties moving towards the transition. First of all, the matter of uh, are our counterparts ready for a woman chair uh, was on the table. The president uh, said that he was not, I mean, he, he said in his own words, I'm not anti-women, but are your counterparts ready for a uh, or a woman chair, so that sort of got, uh, got stuck a little bit there until finally I was a But actually during the time, much of the preparation was uh, negotiations within the government because we were still trying to settle some of the key issues that uh, were part of the, uh, the items that remained unresolved at the time. 
So we were doing that kind of consensus building among ourselves. Uh, it was my birthday on uh, December 3. I was going to November. First time I had to face the president and the uh, members of the cabinet to argue some of our recommendations, including what we now have as the agreement on waters. We used to call it regional waters, but now it's called Bangsamoro waters. That was the first time it was put on the table inside government. Well, as you know, Miriam, uh, most of us have not had the opportunity to be the negotiator for something as large as the task that you took on. Can you describe for us what the negotiation looked like? We know you sit at a table, but what happens at that table? What's the structure of the process? Well, my very nicely prepared uh, diagram here with some photos so we can you can see the, the formal process has always looked like this. There will be two tables across each other. The Malaysian facilitator will be uh, moderating. He will be at the head of the table. You have the big smiley in the center. <laughs> the senior member will be seated at the first, uh, first chair up there, and the chairs will be facing each other uh, on the second seat. Then the rest of the members would uh, take the remaining three seats and we'd be face to face most of the time. So that's how we were structured. We had our secretariat behind us. We could always look behind and ask them for some documents, maybe to check out some information. And uh, occasionally, uh, especially from the MILS side, the chairman Iqbal would ask uh, a lawyer behind him to to do some of the explanations as well. So that's how it goes. Otherwise, we go break for lunch. Uh, during lunch, in the beginning, we were very formal. We had to sit according to protocol. A uh, few uh, months later, we threw away all the protocols and sat wherever we want. We were already at ease with each other by that time. So a lunch table protocol is who can sit beside each other? Is that yeah, there used to be a head table, you know, where a facilitator would sit, the chairs would sit, and then some of the other people, some of the ICG, there's an international contact group that's the, what we call the friends of the process. I think uh, at least here they are, they have a photo. Uh, they sit behind the secretariat. One side would be the government uh, representatives, that's uh, UK, Japan, uh, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia. On the other side would be the uh, ICG members who belong to international NGOs, um, uh, CHD, uh, Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, International Alert, it used to be Asian Foundation, later on replaced by a uh, Catholic group, uh, Community San Ichijo, uh, plus Mahamadiya, which is an uh, Indonesian uh, NGO. They will observe the process uh, and uh, quietly, and they won't speak until they are asked to give some opinion. At least they have been asked. Uh, for instance, uh, we had a very interesting discussion on meaningful political participation of women, and we had to agree on the meaning of meaningful. Uh, the English speakers uh, of the ICG were the first to be asked, what does meaningful mean? So that's uh, very interesting. Uh, when we're doing structure of government, and uh, you know, they want that one uh, parliamentary form of government, which is very different from uh, the system. Uh, uh, experiences or uh, structures or how parliamentary systems work for us of uh, the members of the ICG, uh, just by way of example. So it goes like that, but otherwise most of the talking were done by, uh, by the panels. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's talk about how, what happens in Kuala um, For the last couple of uh, for the last couple of months, Mike and myself have been engaged with each other to prepare for this course, um, conflict resolution skills, uh, and the first topic would be about negotiation. So we've, we've been sharing information about each other. We want to get somebody who has experience in negotiation to come and talk to us. And I understand the other classes are here because they want to listen to your experiences. One of the things that I've been interested in because of the information shared is what happened in Kuala Lumpur. Can you kindly describe to us the process that's involved in Kuala Lumpur? Okay, we, usually, we usually open with the formalities like an opening statement by the facilitator, an opening statement by the two chairs, 
and then we settle on the agenda. Uh, we are going to publish the opening statements from 2010 to 2014 very soon, and they, they provide a very good history and also a kind of discourse to guide the you know, that uh, prevailed all throughout the process because each chair will be talking about what are the issues now, how do we address these, and that, that kind of the opening statement sort of uh, gives you an idea of the state, the state of the action negotiations. And then we move to the agenda and somebody is asked to speak first. Um, and uh, most of the time, actually, we, it's not really the chairs doing all the uh, negotiating, all, all the talking, definitely not. Uh, the chairs will come in to do some of the processing of uh, what has been said uh, uh, back and forth. Um, chairs pick up on uh, that kind of uh, an exhaustive discussion has taken place over say one issue. And some of the issues that do become very emotional. You know, uh, we know that this is a very emotional issue, especially for our counterparts. So there were there have been some instances when uh, uh, the facilitator will <laughs> stand on the table and say. Okay, let's go for a break to diffuse the, the tension. Uh, and a lot of times, so we will just be listening, actually, listening to uh, the, uh, the, the unleashing of the uh, emotion and careful not to inflame it <laughs> further by just quietly listening. That's, that's a very good point. Um, that can lead us to the next question that I want to ask you. Um, you've talked about how the, the uh, negotiation is structured in Malaysia. How do you handle difficult situations? Well, uh, difficult situations, and there were a lot, uh, situations having to do largely with the negotiating uh, items. So we had a very difficult time on the wealth sharing and revenue generation annex, uh, the, uh, the access that would be devolved, uh, the uh, sharing arrangements from Natural, the wealth generated from natural resources. And of course, before we actually went there, 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 there had been a process of exchanging notes through the facilitator where we had our negotiating position uh, already clarified so that when we got to the table, there was really that, you know, the moment to settle the, the issue. And uh, I remember Chairman Iqbal being asked in uh, uh, the first press conference when we signed the last annex and he was asked uh, what was the hardest part about the negotiation and his answer was getting our counterpart to agree to our stand. <laughs> Which is of course natural. That's the hardest part. You agree, you get them to agree. And sometimes we think about each other's bottom line. Uh, we have to read through what they're saying, they read through us. Uh, is this really the max, mid, the maximum position or the mid, the maximum position that each one can take? Is this going to be the deal breaker so that uh, we, if we don't move here, it's not, it's going, everything uh, flounders, you know, everything just cannot move further. It's that kind of a reading because everything is still being negotiated. If, uh, you, and usually, it's like a bargain. You go to the market, you know, the, the seller is to the highest price and you go really down the low and then you sort of find the, find the uh, middle ground somewhere there. So a lot of bargaining, a lot of playing chess. Uh, being able to see how you will do your uh, moves so that you are able to, you know, when we come, when we go to the negotiating table, we have our marching orders. When they go there, they have their guidance from their central committee. And if things are not moving, we have to communicate that and say, you know, we probably need to compromise somewhere on this. And our principals can say yes or no. If they say no, then we go back and uh, just stick to our position until we get down to a point where, uh, uh, you know, we don't really know if we can get anywhere. So, especially on that annex, until the last minute, we didn't know that we would be able to finish at almost 11 p.m. Uh, because we were stuck on some of the issues and uh, we just didn't know who would be able to keep in on some of these. And usually it ends up being a quick pro quo. Okay, we agree to this, we we'll give this that. So we have to make sure which one we can sacrifice and which ones we can. 
I understand there's uh, a lot of things that are done before you come to the table and you have uh, talked about the sharing of notes with the facilitators. In terms of how that helps you to deal with difficult situations when they arise um, in the negotiation process, so that this kind of progressions do it's help you. very important because for us, we have to know what the concerns are behind the issue. If we're able to address the concern, uh, then we can come up with alternative compromises that can uh, that can uh, that can meet the concerns of our of the government. Uh, the president, of course, is our principal, but not just the president. On each and every issue, there are the cabinet secretaries who are in charge of. Uh, uh, say it's taxes, it's the bureau, it's the commission, uh, tax commissioner. If it's on uh, financing, it's the finance secretary. The president has always said that you'll have to get their consent as well. And they, if they don't go for it, then you know, uh, it doesn't get very far unless we go straight to the president. The president has other ideas. So, uh, so this thing. But the point is to really uh, what this is the, the what really worked was for us to hear it out. What's, what are the issues here? What are the concerns with regard to this negotiation? And then to be able to, uh, to uh, move around that and find uh, a solution. Sometimes it's very basic. Some are, some, a, a, a lot of the concerns are very symbolic. Because this, this is really about identity. This is about uh, uh, restoring uh, the wounds of our dignity as well. So most of these issues we found out, wow, well, this, these were not really substantive, substantive issues. These were symbolic issues. But because we, uh, we were able to see that, and we were able to address the symbolic, symbolic uh, concerns, then we were able to move ahead. I mean, okay, specific example. It was just simply moving uh, the columns in a matrix with uh, the sequencing. Because for their constituency, when they read something, they do not want the, the, their uh, constituency to get stuck on one component and not see the rest and be, feel that insecurity. I'm referring, for instance, to the decommission of weapons uh, and combatants as part of the agreement. They need to see the socioeconomic uh, elements first, they will need to see the uh, uh, the other security concerns, the other armed groups want to move the other armed groups before they get to the part when they, they can see that, that their part, which is that they will be decommissioning their weapons and combatants. That's it of the matrix, we just move the columns. It's the, and uh, the concern was address. Of course, after months of negotiations on each and every box there, that you now find in the, the matrix, you find it in the latter part of the document that we'll be giving you. I think we have enough copies of the uh, comprehensive agreement. It's the annex on uh, normalization, which is really the treaty part, the treaty as part for, for an armed group to transition from being an armed group to, uh, to, uh, to, some, to, to so many other things, a social movement, a political party, uh, civic organizations, government as well, to come, become government members of the government as well. Thank you. So you've raised the point of the delicateness of a negotiation process, the, the need to listen deeply to each other, uh, flexibility as you talked about, altering your matrix, that deep kind of listening for the interests and needs that people have. We want to move to thinking about the agreement in light of what you just said. How do you know, now we've reached an agreement and it's a good agreement, how do you know that now is the time to say there's an agreement and that, it, that you can call it a good agreement? Well, uh, we did uh, the framework agreement for annexes as a agreement and then they added this new agenda which we uh, 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 accepted and it's now the agenda. So when we got to the third annex, we knew that there was no third turning back. I mean, if you have three out of four, why should you lose everything because you can't agree on one single item? Of course, that single item might be substantive, but there, that means that there, there will have to be a way 
to address that. Uh, you, you know, like it's like swimming one half of the the, the river. <laughs> like you get a midpoint, you don't swim back. You just swim on to the other side. And I guess, I guess that's that's the. So at one point we're saying there's no there's going to be no deal breaker here anymore because we've gone this far. But of course it didn't mean that the negotiations were any easier. We still had to do a lot of knocking uh, horns. <laughs> right, so a key thing is momentum, as you're saying, as you think back to the first one, was there any particular challenge that stands out in terms of creating that good agreement for that first one that you had to undergo before you really felt you had the momentum of knowing each other so, the first one was when I came in as chair, and so they were trying to figure me out. Uh -huh. And uh, I can tell you that there were issues raised against me. And it's part of the process. Uh, and uh, our, the secretary, our presidential advisor, always say, you know, they also said that about the first chair. So it's, it's usual. Uh, but at the end of it, they would always say, uh, uh, be hard on the issues, not on the person. That would mean that they were also hard on, on the person at other points in time. Uh, and uh, it was an agreement, of course, that you don't choose who the negotiators are from uh, the other side. You just have to work with them. But that's a challenge that uh, the fact that they, their negotiators have really stayed on for most parts, but the government negotiators kept on changing. So they had to figure out each one all the time. Uh, and a lot of adjustments, also the fact that this was the first woman chair. You know? uh, the, the idea that you don't quarrel with a woman in their culture, that they don't quarrel with a woman. And, uh, uh, but in any case, you know, it's, it's really, uh, uh, the, chair is not, it, the chair is not exactly the, uh, he's very cool at the, like, the, the chair of the MLF, and it was not never really a problem in terms of that. But in any case, uh, Early in the first annex with a very controversial issue and also having to deal with the schedules of our principal. You know, we went to an election in 2013 uh, and that really delayed uh, many of the things. And that's why there was a huge gap between uh, the second annex and the third. Uh, February was the set. January, February, we produced two annexes. Then we sort of got dragged into the electoral cycle and uh, we didn't get to the third annex until July. Elections were in May. And that created a lot of tension inside the MILF. They felt that this was being relegated, uh, that uh, government, you know, if you, we talk about trust and confidence. Every time trust and confidence is tested, are tested. Every step of the way, these are tested. That's why every step of the way, this would have to be sustained. And that's both ways, both ways. Because sometimes you have to deal with intelligence reports about what they're telling their constituents in their in the, and that intelligence report gets to the president, president gets concerned about this, and uh, also at one point we will tell them, you know, this is the intelligence report and we want you to confirm this. And then they would they, they would need assurance and we would have to, to give back the assurance. So that kind of uh, uh, thing that ups and downs, the trust level go down, goes, goes down. When things go better, they have higher trust. Uh, but anyway, there are, there are intermediary steps that we always take. Uh, the role of the facilitator, the international contact group have been called upon to fill in the gaps uh, during the lulls. We will talk to one and say, can you get this message across? Or they will uh, they will also use other other means to get a message across on some of the really uh, hard issues that we are trying to to settle. I, I also have to note that during the time we went through some critical periods, such as the Saba issue, you know the the, uh, the war that happened because of that, and then afterwards it was the this attack on Samoa led by uh, a group of the MLF. So we did went through in 2013 a lot of uh, extraneous incidents that, uh, that um, at, at the end of it, we stayed together. We stayed together. We might not have the, had the same 
assessment on the significance of the different issues, but uh, we stuck it out. I'm tempted to ask whether they ever really figured you out or if you remained a woman of mystery, but I'll turn it over to Paolo for this question. Uh, just to follow up, I want to pick up a uh, statement you said later on, which I think you uh, described as helping to reach the agreement. And that was, you can't argue with a woman. <laughs> How important is a good understanding of culture, of religion, of identity, of gender in the social process? Very important. Uh, we had a very conscious gender agenda in the talks, in the substantive part, to get it in the text. And it took some time. Uh, we could not say, okay, take it or leave it, or here is everything that we want. It's a very gradual process. By the time of the uh, of the uh, annex uh, on uh, Welsh Union, it was very easy to introduce a gender and development provision. Uh, it no longer necessitated a whole discussion. And uh, when we got into the uh, normalization annex, we, where we wanted to put emphasis on women and children affected by the conflict, it was already a non-issue. But in the early phase, in 2011, 2012, uh, it was uh, very sensitive matters too. So, I, I think we have to credit the MLF for really also opening up on, uh, on all, all of this uh, and uh, also trying to put in also more women in their delegation. They couldn't anymore reorganize the all men negotiating team, uh, but through different mechanisms like the introdu introduction of consultants and technical working groups, uh, then the slots were opened up and there was a more conscious effort to bring in very, very qualified women on their part. On our end, we were almost male female dominated. <laughs> Yes, because I had a bar secretary, our legal team were mostly, there were women, and we had over two out of uh, uh, five initially, and then two out of four in the panel uh, who were women. So, but I would have to credit them for taking on also the kind of broadening, uh, and uh, also the international community, because you know, the pressure from uh, the uh, international NGOs, the funders, that there be a very clear of the gender dimension also and that, that, that created some of the push. So now the agreement has been signed. Agreements um, can be breached. There are potential for um, breach in any agreement. Or they could be implemented successfully. What mechanisms do you have in place to ensure that this agreement is going to be implemented successfully and followed and sustained? I guess both the MI11 government learned from the weakness of the previous agreement. One very clearly, after the agreement was signed, there was no defined mechanism to see it through. The idea that the panels will stay on even after signing the agreement came from the MI11. Because they felt that those who negotiated should be there to all throughout the process of implementing. And that's why we have what we call an exit agreement that the two panels, so we're still called the negotiating panels, although formal negotiations have actually ended. But in any case, there, was, there are still a lot of things being negotiated along implementation, but not anymore in the formal structure that we have. And there's an agreement to meet occasionally in Kuala Lumpur for special meetings uh, still facilitated by the, uh, by the facilitator and the international contact will be go as well. But otherwise, there's more direct contact. Now, we move from an arrangement when they have very stiff protocols where they won't even sit beside me in a public forum like this. Now, increasingly, there that kind of con there's that kind of... First, it was supposed to be a cultural thing. But later on, it was a, a protocol that there was sort of no negotiations outside of formal negotiations. But eventually, they loosened up on that. Uh, and now that we're implementing, there's more direct uh, uh, communication going on uh, between us. But, uh, so there's a mechanism, panel stay on. There's a third party monitoring team made up of nationals and foreigners who will stay throughout the process of implementation. For the, uh, for the 
specific items, say on decommissioning, there's going to be an independent decommissioning body that will work with our mechanisms as well down the line. We still have our ceasefire mechanisms in place, the joint organization uh, committees in place, and so on. So there's, there's all of these very developed infrastructure. I think if there's uh, one model that we have introduced, actually, it's this kind of infrastructure that have evolved throughout the uh, throughout throughout the decades of uh, negotiation on the ceasefire to uh, addressing criminality. We have uh, a mechanism for that, uh, and now to the implementation phase. Uh, Mike has uh, has an overview of the, the structure before the agreements. So we're putting more on top of all of this. Uh, the ceasefire, the CCC is really the committee for the coordinating committee for the cessation of safety of the ceasefire committee. So it's a, it's a, it's quite an elaborate uh, infrastructure, but that's the idea to make sure that there will be a mechanism to uh, to address uh, all facets of implementation, from the security to the social economic. To, to, to now we're moving to transitional justice and reconciliation. We have agreed to put up a TJRC, it's a commission made up of three people. The Swiss uh, government has agreed to uh, chair this commission and a uh, Swiss expert will be coming soon to work with the nominee each of the panels to produce uh, in one year a comprehensive set of recommendations. Uh, uh, that will be institutionalized by way of uh, doing TJR, transitional justice and reconciliation. So a lot of uh, mechanisms, actually. Sometimes you feel maybe it's overdeveloped mechanism. We need to streamline here. Socioeconomic uh, mechanisms have not really been, uh, it's a lot of initiatives going all over, but uh, we're thinking, so we're still uh, trying to level uh, the kind of coordinating mechanism for that. For instance, we have a lot of donor interest, but uh, where do they go if they wish to uh, <laughs> uh, to donate or support uh, the agreement? There are some mechanisms, but where really are the, you know, how is it going to be in the next two or three years uh, for all of these uh, macro and micro interventions on the social economic front? Thank you. I think our audience, Miriam, would also like to know a bit about you, the chief negotiator, as a person. So as you think about what it means to be a negotiator, you've been thinking about that for a while now, what are some of the qualities that you think, from your experience, that a good negotiator needs to possess? Of course, you think that if you're negotiating, you do, you do a lot of talking, but really, you, you really have to listen. You really have to listen and see the uh, the undercurrents because sometimes, especially in a culture, well, we're all we work with Filipinos, but they do have their distinct culture as well. And uh, it's a and, and as you know, it's not a culture where you you are very frank with each other, even as Filipinos, but even for say uh, the, the negotiator on the other side are mostly looking the ones. They don't have their own culture as well. Uh, and so you have to read really between the lines. You really see. Sometimes you have to interpret it from a cultural perspective. And uh, we lamented, for instance, how very few books there are on the Malindanao culture. Maybe more have been written on the islands, uh, about the islands part. Uh, very little on uh, Malindanao still. Uh, other uh, ethnic groups. Uh, or we will talk to other Vietnamese and ask for an explanation. What does it really work uh, from, uh, from, uh, uh, from the way they do things, the way they, uh, they say things? Um, because it's not like, you know, like very rapid. It's not like straight out. Uh, you have to go around. <laughs> you have to go around a lot. And, uh, and you just get a you cannot meet emotions at the same level, especially in government, because we you know this is it's a history of uh, people who feel they have been aggrieved. So to that extent, you are uh, this is their uh, this is the time when you are actually having to be the one to draw them in uh, into a process and let them 
let of steam that history of grievances and uh, uh, sometimes you feel that efficiency level this is not good you know from an efficient from an efficiency calculator we're spending too much time just talking about this issue listening to the history again and again of the struggle and uh, uh, we did try to introduce some uh, Objects because we cannot be listening to history all the time. But there will be times when you just have to go through it again. Uh, in fact, I can remember several discussions that were like, wow, this is the job, it's the same thing again <laughs> and, and again. Uh, I'll give you an example uh, intellectual property rights, which is really different from cultural property rights. So we, we have to uh, uh, make a lot of distinction. This is the one on the power sharing annex. But upon uh, just discussing the international framework for IPR, uh, the, uh, we had to go through these discussions on the cultural properties that they felt had been uh, taken away from them, such as the Salim uh, many other items. You know, it was like listening to the same uh, arguments again, <laughs> and, uh, but you just have to go through it. You have to go through it and that tells you how emotional this thing is, how important it is, and therefore you need some symbolic acknowledgement of, uh, of this matter in the text as well. It's not easy to be a um, negotiator, and it takes a lot to become a negotiator, particularly to become a chief negotiator for a country like you. Were these skills that you were born with, or is this something that you learned in the way? I'm sure nobody was born with killing skills. <laughs> you probably were born for survival skills, uh, like the clenched fist of the child, uh, trying to cling on to something, but uh, otherwise, uh, uh, <laughs> okay, what do you say? Uh, you don't need to be uh, more patient than that or maybe less temperamental than others, but I don't know if that blocks out artists from being with negotiators. Maybe not necessarily the case. I mean, going by the stereotype of artists being more temperamental and so on, but these are stereotypes. No? But otherwise, uh, how do you say, uh, they're all kinds, and sometimes you adjust. They actually adjust to your counterparts, uh, to their style, to their different personalities. Uh, it's a mutual adjustment. And it helps, of course, if there are very cool, cool heads around the table, both ways. We do have very cool heads in our panel as well. Um, and we temper each other because when you're in the heat of an argument, sometimes you need the other person to tell you, go down, go down. You kick each other under the tables. If I cannot, if I cannot kick the other person because he's uh, two seats away, I'll tell the person who's like, can you kick? And you keep the person say, go down, go down. <laughs> or sometimes I had an occasion where my, uh, my, part, my, panel, the, uh, my seatmate on the other side would go there, please. Go down. <laughs> so I don't know what they're doing on the other side. <laughs> but sometimes we'd be whispering and uh, some people would whisper too loud that we really make you know, it could become a bad joke. You know? They can hear you very well on the other side. But they're saying, please whisper more. <laughs> so, there's a skill, knowing how to whisper well. <laughs> and work as a team. It was very important for us to have that kind of teamwork. Because, uh, you know, it's, you can, it, it's sometimes you, you be the bad guy on this and I be the good guy. So that they don't sort of zero in on you. I mean, think who is playing who on the other side as well. Uh, if they're actually playing or if it's really natural, sometimes you, need, you do these kinds of assessment. Just, uh, just you know, different personalities on, on the other, on the other side as well. Thank you. Now, Yuri, you've mentioned and we've mentioned here that you are the first woman chief negotiator. And you mentioned some challenges of that, but we did want to ask you specifically, did it matter that you were a woman and chief negotiator? Were there any particular challenges that you faced because of that 
dynamic that maybe you haven't already mentioned that you had to think about in terms of your preparations or in moments within the negotiation? Well, uh, one is, uh, you know, in the early years, uh, the more, MLA is supposed to be the more Islamic group, right? The other one is the MLA, uh, a more secular group, more a national division from in the early years when I was not even in government yet, but I attended the first public event uh, and women had to wear veils and they were segregated. Uh, it was a big event outdoor and men on one side and women on one side. Uh, I did feel compelled that just because now that we are negotiating with an Islamic group that I had to wear uh, over my head. Uh, during negotiations, certainly not. And some of our Muslim, Muslim women in our team, it was their individual choice. So we were not going to, you know, get up just so that we would be more acceptable if that was a, and I think again, we, that we, should, we appreciate that perhaps for them they did feel that we had to, we, we had to face them uh, in that sense, especially for somebody who's not Muslim, yeah. you know, not Muslim. And uh, maybe they would have other standards for some of the women in our team who chose not to wear the veil. And we know that there were probably some issues there. But the woman just had to stand up for what, what would give her comfort level uh, during the time. Uh, but in any case, uh, some of these outward manifestations, you do need to be careful as well. I mean, you always wear long sleeves during, uh, you don't. You don't wear what you ordinary would wear, uh, but uh, in other occasions. So that the kind of uh, the kind of you know, it's part of uh, adjusting to that uh, other culture. Uh, but otherwise, on the more substantive level, we were we were you know the, even the facilitator would say uh, uh, one of his famous lines were uh, watch out for the women. They're after the kitchen man. <laughs> because we would really have your life, uh, percentages, uh, you know, especially you know, it's not it's not just me, but also the one the one who was in charge of the annex on the organization. Uh, she's uh, she's she's the deputy uh, director general of the National Security Council, and she rose that high in a security dominate in a field that's uh, traditionally dominated by. Men, but when we were trying, we were negotiating, say, okay, how the facing, the basis for the decommissioning, how many percent first phase, how many percent second phase. Of course, we wanted to put back everything towards the end, uh, the commission at the last time, uh, at the last part, and we were pushing everything uh, forward. The commission is substantive, a substantive number in the beginning, and then paper all. Uh, so that was really hard bargaining, and. Uh, uh, we have to be smart, <laughs> and I think uh, they weren't prepared for that kind of uh, hard marketplace bargaining on numbers. <laughs> but so sometimes you 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 write down the stereotype when you're told watch out for the housewives. Uh, we would have been angry at such housewifey jokes, but otherwise, hey, it's okay, it's okay. We it's it's producing the results. <laughs> And we could live with that kind of uh, joke because it, it is the atmosphere. Uh, and some of these jokes, a lot of gender jokes in the beginning that we had to put up with. Uh, but you know, it's it's for them. It's part of the adjustment. Not just the also the facilitator because the facilitator is also male and uh, coming from uh, uh, that uh, uh, conservative, basically conservative as well. But I, I would appreciate this facilitator because he was, uh, he knew how to, he, he had, he was witty. He would uh, joke and that would certainly ease up the atmosphere. At the beginning it was joke about men and women until, yeah, I guess it was part of the adjustment. Uh, later on it became other jokes. <laughs> so we overcame that, uh, you know, small talk, uh, over the dinner table, and it always would end up become a, a, a male woman thing. And afterwards, we said, "Oh, we don't want to sit at that table anymore. We're sick and tired. Not just us. There's another woman in the ICG. Uh, only one woman. 
woman in the international contact with those colleagues. So in both international NGOs and governments, there's no male dominated. So. Thank you. We want to end the time with lessons learned, but since we are a live streaming event, we have had questions coming in from our international audience watching this. And one of the questions that has come in from the audience is, how did you sustain yourself amidst your difficult work? So how did you as a person keep your energy, sustain yourself in this? Well, uh, we really, really stay up late at nights because after the meetings, which had no schedules at all, some of it would really sometimes end seven uh, late at night and we'd still do our assessment or I'd still need to meet with the group because we had several meetings actually taking place at the same time and we were doing the annexes. We had, say, uh, three technical working groups meeting at the same time. The panels would be uh, assigned to different working groups or the chairs would be sitting and uh, they would be reporting uh, the progress. And so sometimes it would, be, it would be necessary to meet separately with the different groups, uh, just getting uh, 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 a sense of what's uh, what's going on, or them checking for what's our decision on this, uh, what are the parameters for negotiation on this. So uh, some of the some of the men would smoke, and they would have their own socials, just smoking. Um, MILF and government and facilitator who was a smoker as well. So they would have these uh, informal sessions. Uh, some of us would just go to the stack room and we would have informal sessions with the other MILF who were also uh, uh, eating some of the snacks. But otherwise, uh, for me, I do some yoga exercises at night or in the morning if it's possible. Before we still try to bring our jogging. <laughs> And so we can do some jogging around the area of chaos to see, you know, the place it has a good uh, area. But there is, uh, eventually there was just no time to do that anymore. Uh, so we hang out among ourselves uh, and just, you know, uh, <laughs> let off steam among ourselves. <laughs> so we always we are sure we're not being back in this time. <laughs> Otherwise, they hear all our gripes and everything. <laughs> so I'm sure they would also let off steam. <laughs> we, you know, it's a love-hate relationship. <laughs> now it's more, uh, it's more, it's a very friendly relationship. But during the negotiations, you can imagine, you know, uh, we'd be aghast at what they would, what they said at the, <laughs> at the negotiations and uh, things that they were. It's just letting off, letting off. It's natural, but it's, 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 a, it's. Something that's, I guess, is natural, but otherwise, I think we have built the friendships there and we know each other very well now, and there's a lot of trust. And that really makes things very easy to move forward on the negotiation. The, the fact that you have the trust and that you have the confidence on each other, and uh, sometimes you know you can, you know, sometimes even you know you can fool me anymore on that end because I know already how you do. And I guess they're reading uh, the fact that they can read us very well. Uh, they know when we just be joking and that we're actually just negotiating still. And uh, before we get down to the core issues and find the way around. Thank you. That makes it very real. Uh, we would like to now take a question from the audience. Is there someone that uh, has a question? Mike, you'll assist us with the mic there. Okay, uh, we're now welcoming questions from the audience. I believe some classes are prepared for this as well, right? Yeah. Just raise your hand. Yes. I have one question over here. Do identify yourself in the group that you belong to. Are you Hassan? And um, this time I'm representing Brahma Kumaris. Uh, yes, I'm going to ask a question. You mentioned that you have marching orders from the president. I would like to know what was your personal goal or aim uh, in playing your role as chief negotiator? Well, uh, I've been following through the process from outside government uh, from the 1980s, actually, both the companies, the, the, the negotiations with the communist group and the, uh, this group. And my, my personal goal is really to have peace in this country, to be able to achieve uh, an agreement that is uh, that will uh, 
really create the institutions that would work. Because the, it, this is really just a long phase, and then there will be people and institutions. So uh, that's very important. But the, the institutions, the institutional design, all the different elements, we really have to push also inside government. It took a long time for government to appreciate. The different, I mean, you have different levels of appreciation from one person to another uh, in the cabinet. But it was a good thing that the president was really broad-minded on this and uh, he could carry the rest who were very skeptical still. So inside government, you have to build that kind of consensus. But at the end of it, it's really coming to terms with a uh, partner, which is, uh, of course, the MLF, and uh, making sure that uh, we avoid all the pitfalls of the past. You have that kind of uh, transformational change. We've always said uh, we're not sliding back into patronage. This is not about simply getting things done and doing it by, you know, uh, tagging a lot of offers uh, so that they, they get into the mold and uh, uh, the benefits attract them more than the actual goal of uh, uh, creating all of these changes. And uh, I think uh, it's very important that we get that message across to them. This is not the usual patronage type of politics. If we will, we, if it means uh, not getting things as easily as they would have wanted, it's because uh, this would have to be founded on very solid, uh, solid ground that is based on uh, new norms and uh, institutions that would work and practices that would not be repeated anymore. So uh, I, I think part of the process is also understanding each other's weaknesses. I mean, we had to explain to them how government works because they were coming from the outside. One, they thought that Congress is part of government, the, the, the signatory. Definitely, it took a long time just for them to accept, no, Congress is a separate branch of government. Uh, and that means that the president will do the work using his capital, but it will have to be within all of these legal processes that where, the, where Congress is a separate institution in itself. Uh, on their side, we know that there's a lot of capability building, that there's a, they will need a lot of help to really ensure that uh, uh, all their commanders will be one with them, uh, especially when we get to the brass tacks of the decommissioning. And so we, sometimes we have to explain, you know, the, we have to explain to our audience, to our public, and to our constituency that uh, we know that the MILF has its weaknesses, but we just need to help them be stronger and not, in fact, not weaken them, especially the leadership. Because only with a strong partner can you really uh, see through this uh, whole process. If it gets fractured, then we have more problems. Rather than if we have a, a leadership that really is able to mobilize uh, all the brand, all the different segments of the organization, the religious, the ulama segment, the military segment, and then of course the political base, which are made up of uh, civil society organizations and ordinary. <coughs> so, but that's that's the goal for me. It's really about getting things done well, uh, so that it will it will not, you know, all the momentum, all the gains that have been. Achieve the not simply the not simply. Thank you. Yes, Others. we've got a lot of hands. On. Can I just uh, you know, show hands? How many would like to ask questions? Because I want to sort of move from Philippines to say you over there. Yes. Hello. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Nota. I'm from Germany. Um, looking at the implementation of the peace agreement, what do you think is the biggest challenge for you for the committee? Well, uh, we have our, we need to consolidate our ranks, and that's what we have been doing. Uh, our police, our uh, uh, armed forces, we don't have any, I mean, they have been with us, uh, very supportive of the ceasefire, but otherwise, well, a lot of the reforms will have to come into the police force, for instance. Uh, so, uh, 
uh, that kind of uh, moving together and we're very happy that the, we were getting a lot of support institutionally now. Now there's a uh, COMELEC has been very supportive. COMELEC will see through the plebiscite. We have been in meetings with them. They're already preparing for the plebiscite. But uh, so internally, that's the, that's, these are the challenges that we have to address. Make sure that government is able to deliver. And you know, it's a bureaucracy. There are lags, takes time, and everything. So that's why we always had to prepare way ahead so that now that we're fully implementing uh, uh, the the inertia, well, the part of the initial inertia would have already been addressed. And a lot of coordinating mechanisms that we have to put up, we're proposing some of the mechanisms for that, that interagency mechanism, so that everybody is really, there are specialized people attached to this process from the different agencies, and we can count on them to mobilize their respective institutions. That's internal. Uh, recently, the, uh, the MILF, still, uh, they have said, they have expressed that they have a narrow bench, which means that they have to take, they have to uh, really uh, produce people that they can hope they can trust, because I'm sure they're, you know, uh, I heard it uh, said by the president, uh, victory has many fathers. A lot of people would want to be on the MILF camp now, but some of them are not really, you know, not uh, organics or, but they need people, they need these professionals, they need uh, all the help that they can get, but not everyone they can trust. Not everyone with pure, pure, pureness of heart uh, to be able to, uh, you know, that, that kind of express interest. And then they do need to build on their own organic membership to envision some of the things they haven't really programmed yet, how things will actually be done. And uh, we have been, we probably have provided them with some of the template on how to how to program uh, these things. Uh, but uh, um, everything in their right time. You cannot really push. You cannot. You, you just some some of the things you just have to wait until uh, if, uh, the elements are ready so that uh, you can uh, move ahead. But in the meantime, you do some of the preparations. You do some of the some of the other things, but sometimes you just have to wait for the right moment to come. Thank you. Yes, our friend from Nigeria. Do you introduce yourself and your group? My name is uh, David Ojalabi from Nigeria. Uh, I'm in the conference resolution session here. Uh, please, I want to take you two bits to do from the Filipinos uh, conference. And see you as an international negotiator. We have a very, very difficult situation back home in Nigeria. Uh, there's a particular group, a faceless, let me put that in, a faceless group is demanding for the Islamization of Nigeria and termination of Western education. Uh, the government of Nigeria is taking vigorous. Uh, Concerted efforts for today and third of today's. Uh, please, from your own words of experience, how do you think uh, this situation uh, can be tackled, uh, addressed, or negotiated? Thank you. Well, we also have our difficult negotiations, as you know, the one with the Communist Party has not really moved past. But otherwise, uh, in the beginning, we really focus on single issues. Uh, human rights would be or international humanitarian law, or observance of international humanitarian law, were some of the initial items that uh, were brokered with the other party. I think, for instance, in this case, we might have an international campaign to facilitate the release, but sometimes it's really hard to convince a group that has to even be in. Uh, observing uh, human rights and international humanitarian law. For the MLF, it, uh, we are very pleased to see that they have uh, taken on this perspective very, very soon. I was involved in the Landmines campaign, and the, one, the Landmines campaign was some of, part of the introduction to, uh, to this whole framework of uh, IHL and disarmament when we brought them to Geneva for some of the meetings with other groups as actually. And, uh, so, 
in with the Communist Party, the bottom line really there is rules of the rules of war because they don't want the ceasefire agreement. So you just focus. It, it starts with very very uh, issue specific uh, um, uh, dialogues or negotiations uh, before you actually get to the big issues. So here, for instance, I don't really know what the what the group is asking. Are they just uh, it's not even very clear yet. I mean, you have seen our situations in southern Thailand. When, uh, of course, uh, southern Thailand is very clear that it's, a, it's an autonomous, it's an ethnic uh, identity movement. Uh, uh, down in the south, the Malay, uh, the Malay, the Malay is against the Malay Muslims against the Thai Buddhists. But in that case, I'm not very sure what they really, really want. But uh, that kind of thing, uh, just stick. We so here is the issue of. Release, releasing the kidnapped uh, victims, observing some of the norms, and then uh, before you can even get to the substantive action. So, I guess that's how the campaign is going on now, right? Very focused on this, and not so much on what's the political agenda in any case of this group. But it's an it's opening, it's an opening for a lot of uh, the for most of the process. You, you negotiate on specific concerns before you actually develop a full table on the, the bigger eight issues. There's always a question, do you negotiate with a group that does not, uh, <laughs> that, that totally ignores uh, uh, humanitarian norms? That's the other question. But uh, at the end of it, you, there will be some negotiation involved. Can it simply be uh, just a military solution all the time? But maybe not the negotiation in the sense of a comprehensive agreement. But there will definitely be dialogues with the people with whom they work with, in the uh, use of mediators, people, you know, a kidnap, a busaya kidnap somebody. It's not like just the military or the police coming in to release the kidnap victim. A lot of medi uh, mediators uh, are involved in releasing a kidnap victim. People whom they can trust, and a lot of people have burned themselves. Justly or unjustly, uh, serving as mediator, some being accused of getting a commission from the ransom money, some of being accused of just doing this for political projection, because some, sometimes it's a political personality that uh, are actually up for this negotiation. So it's also for the mediator or people getting into these kinds of uh, risky things, uh, a, lot, a lot are also at stake. But, of course, uh, you, you judge an, uh, an intervention on if it released the victim or not, whether in fact ransom was paid, whether in fact mediators actually took a cut from the ransom money, or whether that mediator was just doing it for political mileage. But, uh, well, basically the interest here is to the interest of the victim. If that is that gets solved, up to a point it, it works, but up to a certain point it, that kind of, the, the same thing happening again, again, we really have to be because you don't change the pattern, you just uh, replicate the pattern. At one point, the pattern will have to be changed. Okay, we have another question over there. Let me have Uh, and that helps a lot. Uh, 
And I'm sure men would have the support from their husband, uh, from their wives, uh, and that allows them, that frees them. No? So, uh, but it's, it's a lot of balancing. It, it's an agreement. It will have to be a partnership between the husband and the wife. Because my husband has last carry his career too. <laughs> so at one point you were saying, did you tell them that I'm the main breadwinner? <laughs> <laughs> because he will know it, it would appear that he was doing all the household and he must have I must, he must not have allowed that must not have allowed him to pursue his own career. Uh, then I just said, they didn't ask. <laughs> <laughs> this is over a TV program. Again, the question is about how does a woman how is a woman able to do this? Of course, it can only happen when you have support of other women and your husband or your fathers or your, you know, house help, of course, very important in our context. We do still, uh, we are able, other women are able to pursue careers because other women take on uh, the household jobs for them through house help or relatives who stay at home, extended family system. Thank you. Next. Hi, my name is Adina. I'm from Canada. Um, you mentioned uh, in your description of the how the negotiation process happened, uh, that it was very formal at the beginning, but then by the end you kind of did away with the protocol. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the initiatives, actions, activities, gestures that the government of the Philippines, the MILF, the facilitators and the international support did to build trust and build the relationship between the two parties? Well, yeah, some, some of the initial uh, the changes that took place uh, where, for instance, we don't have any meetings. Imagine if we had minutes of the previous meeting, we'd probably spend the next round just agreeing on the minutes. Uh, so that meant that initially, uh, there were very strict rules imposed by the facilitator, the former facilitator, on who could actually uh, record the proceedings, although secretly both parties recorded the proceedings. When uh, we, when things, uh, with the new facilitator, he changed some of the rules. We openly put our digital recorders on the table, which meant that, hey, it's not only one, one, one of the three uh, groups here who is keeping the record, everybody else is keeping the record for their own uses. Of course, with the confidentiality requirements uh, very strictly, uh, strictly enforced. Um, uh, so that, that one, uh, then at one point we requested, government requested, this was in the early phase, no framework agreement yet, no uh, consensus points. Uh, the first signed document was the consensus points in April 2012. We asked the facilitator, can we meet in a, in a nicer arrangement? Not that one that you, you saw there. So we, the facilitator was very well uh, open to the idea. He, we, uh, it was a spe special session, just three on three. We call it a two plus one meeting, two members of the panel. Uh, so the chair, uh, the former chair at the time, and myself, the head of secretariat, two plus one. Two plus one on the other side, the facilitator with his head of secretariat, also a woman, and we were in seated in sofa sideways. So that eased up. We, uh, so some of these little things sometimes in the beginning could, uh, could make things uh, um, lighter and change the dynamics also. So you, before they would organize dinner, so everybody was tired and everybody had to, you know still sit together and then somebody at one point said, let's not have these dealers anymore. <laughs> Allow us to go on our own. Some of us don't even feel like eating dinner anymore because we were just so tired or maybe just order uh, room service. So a lot of that was taken out. <laughs> In the last meeting, you won't believe this, but uh, cup was being used for an ash Maybe the small, the not smoking uh, uh, diehards with objectivists, but uh, we're just finishing up. Everybody, we were signing the last document, standing up, sitting down, moving around. You know, no, none of the formal. They said, they said, let's go make the closing remarks. 
It's such a, it's such a word that we still have to think of the closing remarks for each of the parts. But that was it till then. But in any case, for most parts, you get the opening, the closing. Uh, smokers had to go out of the room. Uh, but at that last minute, we were just, uh, you know, this is the cup text, the one that we signed on March 27. It's like an introductory text. So, uh, a lot of adjustments along the way, and uh, how do you say, the executive sessions became more and more frequent. When we exhausted the, the full panels, where everybody was speaking, uh, there were times when you were speaking before the crowd. You were playing up for the audience, because you can see there are many people inside the room. Uh, especially when the technical working groups came in, and that's, that was uh, three technical working groups with at least three people each. That's more people inside the room, nine on their end, nine on our end, that's 18 more people inside the room, and a lot of, you know, so a lot of the, in the end, a lot of the executive sessions, chair on chair, chair with the chair, uh, chair chair with the facilitator, one on one. Sometimes it's three plus one, uh, two plus one, one on one, a lot, sometimes you get confused what we mean, <laughs> two plus one, and so on. <laughs> So, uh, adjustment. So, um, sit, then go back to the working group, sometimes exchange of notes. Uh, we will just be in the hotel. There will be a lot of uh, paragraphs being exchanged. Sometimes ICG will be asked to craft the paragraph or do a matrix of what's uh, the commonalities between the two positions. And uh, the matrix will at least help us uh, keep track of how far we've come. So a lot of these uh, impromptu arrangements uh, that were used uh, along the way to negotiate very, very specific ideas. Yes, go ahead. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Dwight uh, from Mindanao, and I'm with the Spentering Peace Education course. Uh, Professor, well, I would like to congratulate you for being a woman, woman negotiator. Also, the woman had head of the negotiating panel of the Philippines, uh, and I was able to be uh, in forging a peace agreement with the Moro Samuel Liberation Front. Uh, I am from Milan, so I have been following up the peace process, and I'm happy about the development. Uh, but the work is just begun, and I think more needs to be done in order to implement the comprehensive agreement on the Bansamoro. And at the moment, uh, there is the Bansamoro Basic Law, which I understand has been sent to the President, and which will be provided to the Congress uh, to be made into a law. But uh, at the moment, I think uh, there are a lot of sectors who are comprehensive uh, about what's in that law. And, uh, Aside from that, we also have the existence of other armed groups here in Mindanao, like the Alas Amoros and Freedom Fighters, uh, which is a breakaway group, the MLA, and then we have the Muslim group, and we still have the Paul National Liberation Front. And uh, besides, we also have uh, others as possible spoilers, like politicians. So my, my question is, uh, what do you think would be the main uh, challenges on the implementation of this agreement. Personally, I don't use the word spoilers because I don't think we should like cast. You know, we should not and cast groups or people as spoilers forever. Maybe some of them I can understand the uh, cynicism because we we've gone through so many and uh, we have we're still solving the problem. The skepticism, because this is really complicated, it's not an easy thing. So if people have the right to be skeptical, the, uh, the group interests, the different group interests, uh, will really have to be uh, balanced with uh, the interests of the others. So all of these are, are, are part of the uh, kind of uh, resolution, the, the kind of law that we need to produce to see, to assure, provide that kind of assurance and security to the different groups here. And uh, certainly some of these are still controversial issues with the MLF. Uh, say, for instance, the issue of ancestral domain in regards to other indigenous peoples because the MLF is coming from 
uh, position that there is only one ancestor to me, which is the Bansamoro ancestor to me. Whereas, in fact, there are others who have their own claims to their ancestor to me. So that kind of discourse, uh, contested discourse, is, uh, is still there. I mean, this is still at the discourse level. For the ground, you do have a lot of armed groups, you have a lot of loose weapons. We have commanders that have been trained, or people that have been trained in the, the ID, uh, bombing technology from the international groups that operate as well in the region are, and are given a sanctuary still by the groups that, uh, that have opted out of the process. But, so all of these, but for, for them, the approach really is to show, just to show that this peace process will be different will produce results on the ground, especially social economic benefits and, and uh, maybe more of them will decide not to stick it out with these groups that are still using violence. And it will take time. A lot of uh, other negotiations, but not formal negotiations, no more comprehensive agreement with another group. With the MNLF, there's a diplomatic side to it because we know that the organization Islamic uh, Cooperation is involved in that uh, review process. Uh, and uh, there are different factions involved. There are other offices in the, our office, the other units in our office that are charged with uh, addressing the MNLF uh, influence communities, uh, providing the social economic programs there, also maybe incentives to, to do away with their weapons or to register weapons that may be registered and children. So it's a combination of so many things all at the same time. All at the same time. Doing all of this. Uh, then, of course, just explaining to people, uh, we do hope that some of the critical issues the MILF will also be carefully addressed the bigger public. Because, you know, we knew from the beginning MILF is talking to their audience. To their public, because they cannot lose their public. But when they talk to their public, they lose on the other public, who is our public. Uh, and uh, then maybe uh, that kind of uh, balancing act that they do need more and more also to talk to the bigger public and not just to their public. But we understand why they have to say some things to their public now, which is not actually what was agreed on. It's just a way of giving them, binding them time before they are able to consolidate, do their consolidation work. For instance, police force, there's no wholesale integration of combatants into the uh, police force. On the ground, we know there's that misinformation going on uh, that uh, they will become the future police. But if you look at the recommendations assigned on by the IMLF, uh, produced by the, the Independent Commission of Policing, you would have to meet the requirements to join the police force. But it's just, it's there on the ground, it's uh, buzzing on the ground, maybe they just need time to get there, address that, and explain it. And we need to do it, we, we need to help them explain on the ground as well some of the misinformation that's going on, say, with regards to the, with regard to the decommissioning component. A lot of the security component, especially. Okay, uh, we have two more, and then I'll ask if there are more who want to ask. Um, hi, Professor. My name is Norman Kelly. I am from MSUIID, Institute for Peace and Development in Mindanao, or IPDM. My question is uh, goes like this How do you deal with those who are against the negotiation? How do you address it, or does it affect the negotiating people of both parties? We engage them in dialogue. Uh, that's okay, you know. We, that's why I some some of them are angry that they're being labeled labeled spoilers, and and, and, and I, because it, they feel they're being demonized. <laughs> you know, if there's a wide public uh, support for this uh, this process, you brought somebody like this then they sort of get typecast and that makes them, that entrenches them in their position instead of enabling them to, uh, to move out. Like for instance, some Congress members of Congress and the Senate have been vocal, uh, it's unconstitutional or uh, it, 
it's vague what are the guarantees, say for Zamboanga City, which has been traumatized by the, by the conflict. It, it's just, just constant, continuing dialogue with everybody. Uh, it will never end. The work will never end. <laughs> Simple one from one phase to another, one specific item to another out of explanation. But that's the only way. I mean, what's the other way? Make enemies out of them. Uh, you have to make friends, a lot of friends in this process. Okay, yes, could you come forward, please? And then this will be over here. Yes, good morning. Um, I bring to the, the sessions in, in our course, High Energy. And I come from the course where we talk a lot about restorative justice. Uh, sorry, from the Philippines, yes. And um, I bring a lot into this course, my strong impact orientation also. And I think that uh, since the agreement is there, I'm also thinking of, okay, what is the impact? And in this case, I would like to look at uh, justice and if justice is served. And in the annex uh, of normalization, um, there is this uh, important uh, section on transitional justice and reconciliation and it would be really good for me and for my other uh, classmates in the course if you could share um, the progress or the preparations and the progress already on, on this. You can see it's very sparse. It's yes, just, it uh, is. Three, three, just three numbers. Huh? Because we still have the process between us exactly how transitional justice and reconciliation will be done. And that has been our approach. We cannot really agree. Uh, it doesn't mean that we did go through a lot of uh, hours negotiating that, that just on the TJR. No? But at the end of it, we said that, okay, we cannot settle this now. Our perspectives, different perspectives on how TJR uh, sh should or shall be done. So we created a committee, uh, and that's the commission, that's a study group. That has been one technique here. If we cannot settle it, create the committee. So it's a, uh, you may say, oh, so you're just postponing and postponing. No, but, uh, well, yes, true. Because otherwise, how we will never get to a comprehensive agreement if we have to have everything in the text of the comprehensive agreement. But at the same time, it's also part of uh, the process where we have to put some of the, the elements in place before we can finally agree on some of the elements. Or we have to build on the trust before we can be more secure in moving ahead with the other elements. So uh, that has been the that has been the formula here. Uh, lay aside what you cannot agree on. Move ahead with what you, you can you, what you can what you can already agree. And that's why the big job of TJR will still have to be done uh, in the next months. Next month we will be able to invite you to the launching of the commission. Switzerland we has agreed to. Uh, chair the commission and will finance the operations and the goal is for that group to have a very participatory and inclusive approach in defining the appropriate TJR and the appropriate institutions that will undertake the TJR. Our, our, from our end we want it institutionalized not too many ad hoc bodies. We want the work to be done by the regular institutions, the future regular institutions and the existing institutions, whether these are universities for the collection of historical narratives, oral history, and so on, or the Human Rights Commission in the region, which is already doing some of the human rights work rather than just creating uh, a lot of uh, other bodies that will go away afterwards and then uh, not even sure as to the kind of impact that they, that they have. So it will still it's still going to take shape. There's a divergence. I can tell you there's a divergence in perspective. On their end, it's more reparation, uh, human rights violations, and very heavy on the judicial component. And we have to move them away from a very judicial approach to TJR. Some of the matters have not been fully resolved. And now we still have to deal with an expert who will be bringing in a perspective that might not be exactly the kind of perspective that we want. And that's why we have suggested to the uh, Swiss ambassador that maybe uh, a good approach to do this is to bring us together, MI, government, Swiss experts, uh, somewhere where we can in 
engage each other more deeply and they get to understand us and we get to understand them. It cannot be a foreign framework just coming in, drawn from experiences in uh, other parts of the world. You know, for instance, uh, very clearly, if you ask Chairman Iqbal what does reconciliation mean, reconciliation is the creation of the Baksa Mahal. And that's the political agenda, but for them, that is the historical conflict, and that's what's going to resolve the historical conflict, this kind of self, uh, uh, the institution for autonomous governments. But of course, you know that's not, but that has to be at the core of the whole framework. So it's not about a truth commission, it's not about just reparations for the victims and so on, but it should revolve around the empowerment to really be able to exercise meaningfully the responsibility, the right to self-determination. Then certainly from their end, there's a bias for the victims on their side, and we have to draw them to look at it in terms of the big, that everybody were victims here including uh, the, the, families of, uh, the families of soldiers who were killed and also lost their, their loved ones. So still a lot of uh, discussions necessary to really settle on the claim. But the good thing is the, the Commission, uh, we, have, we have said that we want the approach to be very participatory so that it's not as if TJR comes in only one year after they produce the report. The, the coming up with the report itself should already involve people, and people should immediately feel that this is already part of that healing, uh, healing process. Because if you cannot wait, you only have two, uh, two and a half, two months, two years to really put everything in place. And there are short-term outcomes that will have to be there, and then the bigger institutional outcomes that we, we also want to guarantee. Okay, we only have time to, for two more questions and uh, we... Uh, three? Okay, let's do this. Can we get all the three questions and then she will respond to them all at once? Uh, now I get more hands. <laughs> Please, okay. Come over here. To the microphone. Do we introduce yourself, the country, and maybe your organization? So, is it okay? We'll get all the questions all at once. Uh, all the same notes. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm John and talk to Indonesia. See you guys. Okay, uh, so he's from Indonesia. Yeah, we'll get the mic. Oh, Indonesia. Indonesia. All right, thank and you. And then just help uh, me. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, uh, saya coba mendengar dan tahu bahwa ini sebuah keberhasilan untuk bang Semur. So uh, he has learned from you know the experience that you have just shared and that uh, impressed in the succeed of the you know the signing piece of agreement with bang Semur. Uh, dalam konteks kami di Indonesia. Uh, ada beberapa tempat yang juga bicara tentang harus ada sebuah dialog seperti Aceh, uh, Maluku, Papua dan uh, Timur Leste yang kemarin mendekat. So in, in Indonesia we have uh, we have similar also we have similar and then like we try to reach uh, agreement like this through dialogues and then we have several places maybe you have heard. We have Aceh, and then we also have uh, Riau, we have um, Molukas, Maluku, and then we also have Papua there. Uh, yang jadi persoalan kami adalah kami tidak mampu membangun jauh dengan negara sebab uh, ada di balik itu kekuatan militer intervensi militer yang sangat kuat untuk menutup segala pergerakan jauh. Uh, the problem here is that uh, the dialogue cannot be, you know, it's it's really impossible in Indonesia to have the dialogue like from, from this area like Aceh and the others with the, with the country, with the government because behind it there is uh, the strength of military which, is, which has really been strong to affect, you know, the dialogue. Uh, saya, 
supaya segala hal yang saya hadapi di Indonesia bisa saya selesaikan dengan sebuah dialog yang menguntungkan uh, semua. Terima kasih. Oke, okay, so I have a question, finally. The question is, uh, would you please kindly share uh, what can we do as a peacemaker in that when we go back to Indonesia and then how can we bridge, like bridge, uh, you know, this uh, intervention so we can, we can have the dialogue, like, you know, there's a possibility for, for further dialogue between the government and also within the people from these different areas in Indonesia. Thank you. Um, we'll get the range of questions. Yes, my friend. Also from Indonesia, right? Yes. Careful with the camera. Yeah, I'm, from, uh, I'm still from Indonesia. Uh, we in Indonesia, we have uh, we continue to confront what to say. We have two experience. Experience, experience like a uh, disagreement. Uh, Aceh, they make agreement in Helsinki, but they out from uh, from Constitution Indonesia. Out from Constitution Indonesia, they make agreement, but not for Constitution Indonesia. And now they have uh, they have they can price with their own flag. Uh, they have local party and. They, they can make uh, their own law and, and it's one uh, and two, Papua Papua 21 but they make uh, agreement in Indonesia constitution now the, the Indonesia, they give autonomy but just money, not authority you can make your uh, law on law but must be uh, look Indonesia law. I think autonomy is uh, about uh, dis discrimination positive, like specialists in the law, like specialists. You can make your own. And, and then um, I look at what's uh, happening in the now. Um, I want my ask is how uh, the government corrected for uh, this agreement still continue. Because I hear from my friend, uh, now the uh, people in Mindanao just like one, one senator and there is many uh, faction um, and uh, not uh, full autonomy. Let me see if I got that right. Uh, the question is, how is the government going to ensure that this agreement holds? Is, was that how it's going to Okay. Um, the question is, how is the government ensuring that the agreement holds? Still will continue. Okay. Although he gave a background of a lot of things. Yeah, constitution was mentioned, so that's the context, yes. Yeah. Good morning, good morning. Congratulations, ma'am. Um, I'm Dino, I'm from Manila de la San Carlos of St. Benil. And I'm attending uh, Strengthening Skills in Peace Education. I just want to ask you about the process of negotiation you underwent. Was there a moment in the process where in the other panel exhibited uh, behavior that appeared to you, oh, they're close-minded already. They're not listening to reasons. I don't know if gender would, would factor in here. A man, a, a Muslim man would be negotiating to a woman. Um, and then, especially if you outwit them, for some, for some elements in the negotiation, was there, was there an instance wherein you had this impression or they're no longer listening to reasons? Their e ego uh, was touched already. And how did you manage that? Thank you. And I think last, yeah. right? Okay, good. So you have seated the last. Daughter Mizi. 
Good morning. My name is Tanisi Abdullah. I am a volunteer at MPI, and then I'm the representative of the religion, guys. <laughs> uh, our question, uh, did the interreligious dialogue play a role in the peace negotiation? And what are the impacts of interreligious dialogue, if there are? You can give maybe an emphasis during the time of uh, when uh, Attorney Hamid Bara, who is a former convener of the Bishop Ulama Conference, because yesterday we have Kapaya in our class. And uh, you can give emphasis on that when uh, he was a member, one of the members of the government of the Philippines. Thank you. Great. Um, it's up to you, ma'am. Which one do you want to take first? Uh, okay, uh, Indonesia questions first. Uh, yeah, you, you first uh, concerned about before human rights violation. Uh, you were concerned about uh, constitutional framework. It's it was also an issue with our negotiation. I know that uh, in the Indonesian constitution, no no regional parties were allowed, but they allowed it for hardship, um, which was an exception. One of the most critical issues uh, of the negotiating agenda. In our case, certainly what they wanted was way beyond what the Constitution could, uh, could uh, provide. And for the President, if he will spend his term trying to change the Constitution by 2016, they may end up, may end up with nothing. So that was the key stumbling block in the beginning of the talks so 2011, 2010, 11. And that's why the President decided to meet with Murat. There's this uh, uh, unannounced meeting of the president with the head of the MLF in Japan. Everybody was surprised. The media was mad because they had no idea that it was going to happen. The president said, I think you're getting stuck. Why don't I talk to Murad himself? And it's his, it was his suggestion. No peace advisor gave it to him. It came from him. Sometimes we, after that, we read commentaries. Who, was the stupid, who are the stupid advisors of the president? telling him to meet with this, uh, the leader of the MLF and uh, in a foreign country, secret, raising all of these issues and so on. But that was a point when he felt an extraordinary effort needed to be done. And the key issue, one of the key issues there was precise. No, they did not talk about substantive agenda. That was very clear. No substantive agenda negotiated between the president and the chair. Only hearing their concerns and the president also having the opportunity to explain to the other party how he sees the whole thing going. And one, very clearly, I will not support constitutional change during my term. Because his priority was to clean up government, uh, make government work, and constitutional reform is probably not the main, uh, the first step to be able to do that. So the compromise there is that we, they produce the law, which falls under the constitution, but now they, they can still come up with another document that proposes the recommendations for constitutional change. Some very valid, I would agree with some of these. For instance, they want senators not to be elected nationally, but senators on a geographic basis so that you can be sure that there will be a senator from the Mount Samoro. Because now everybody's from Metro Manila. Uh, uh, and brothers and sisters, or see brothers and brothers, and so on. So, so that's that's how we were able to address that. Every now and then, it still crops up uh, the constitution that they wanted to, to you know to go fast track on the constitution rather than the law. But the guarantee there is, you have the law, you have the box tomorrow, then you are in a better position to pursue <coughs> constitutional change later on. Uh, that that was our approach. I, I don't know about the particular case of Papua, but certainly. We should, we should try to get a better deal the way Ancho was able to get uh, their agreement. When it comes to human rights violations taking place, I think in the social movement history of the country, human rights the human rights movement was very strong all throughout martial law, but it was not linked to a peace framework. And when peace, uh, the peace movement was born after martial law in 1986, only did we try to converge to the human rights movement. Because you, you know, you get focus on condemning, condemning uh, human rights violation, you get stuck, you know, it, it's very hard, once a violation is done, it's very hard to get justice. But the preventive really there is to get through a peace agreement. And that's why uh, that kind of link should be very 
very clear. Human rights with peace. The activism of human rights engagement uh, be uh, modified to, in, to bring in the peace activism so that there's a, a clearer solution, not just in terms of condemn the military, condemn the government, but actually uh, being able to transform the political arrangement through a peace and uh, a peaceful process. Uh, secondly, uh, on the, the questions on the by the two, uh, a moment, I, I will get to your question. Uh, Dr. Bara, yes, Dr. Bara is a professor uh, from uh, MSU who is an Islamic scholar and uh, he was part of our panel in the beginning. He decided to concentrate on his work, which is to build, I think, an Islamic institution and, uh, and resign. But during the phase when we were discussing some of the gender issues, the, the, the comments of an Islamic scholar from a very progressive perspectives such as Dr. Bara were very, very helpful. For instance, we wanted the right to privacy to be reiterated as a special, special, uh, you know, special dimension in the rights. There was a discussion about Aliwat. Aliwat is a woman and a man being caught in a compromising position. And in some Islamic culture, there would be punishment for them, like the moral police being able to arrest them, to a man and a woman, not married, holding hands, can be arrested in some societies. So uh, that very well informed discussion on what, uh, how to interpret the, uh, a secular right such as the right to privacy from an Islamic perspective and being able to see how it can come together. Not only that, even on the commercial aspects, uh, it was very useful. It was very helpful for us that we have a, we had on the government side. Uh, a very learned uh, Islamic scholar uh, say on uh, some of the elements that the MLF wanted to be introduced into the political structure, the concept of a hispa, uh, a trade regulator, uh, the one who is in charge of regulating markets, and, uh, and uh, which is not exactly uh, uh, just an ombudsman, but, an om but someone focused on that aspect. So clarification of the concepts and everything. Uh, was very helpful uh, with, uh, with some of the negotiated items, uh, particularly in relation to, to Islam. I don't know if I got the focus of your point, but these are just two examples. Uh, the other one, uh, to do, uh, it was a time when we, we uh, it slipped me, when we had to, the other side was close-minded and we had to uh, you know, poker, uh, Mr. Iqbal has a poker face. Don't know what's going on in his mind. <laughs> and uh, we never really knew if he, that is really the last of it or if he's still willing to go down. <laughs> uh, and, or if we have to go up and he would be willing to beat us halfway. Uh, he'd go down and we'd go up and we could meet halfway. Uh, uh, how did we deal with that? That was the question. Uh, Again, all of the informal techniques would come into play. Facilitator, we're negotiating, we're helping ex explain our position and uh, giving them the, give, relay the message to them. Sorry for the president, this is a, it's then the day here, okay? Is it really the, the president already speaking now or just the chair uh, saying this? <laughs> they would have that. Uh, and we would also have that question, is it just the, uh, Negotiator, or is really the central committee? Uh, then you know you get to, uh, to be able to feel your way uh, along along those uh, uh, those moments when you were not really moving forward. You use intermediaries, you use people. They call up. They, they are fond of calling up one person, whom they know is close to the president, and that person will get the message to us and to the president as well. Uh, so sometimes like that. Uh, a lot of uh, sometimes cross uh, uh, okay, these cross lines sometimes cross lines taking place, but it's part of the process. And for us, it's uh, because the government is united, the executive branch. We are able to process these all the different lines that are being used. It gets sort of into the central communication system, and we are able to process and read exactly what's going on on their side. At least there are no, uh, there are no, uh, how do you say, from inside the government, people who are going the other way.
back to the hosts. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'm sure a lot of uh, peace builders in the room have been learning lots of lessons from you as you talk about your experiences. The last question is really about uh, lessons learned. As you can see, MPI is a gathering of peace builders from all over the world. Um, in the room you have representatives from countries from the Northern Hemisphere and also the Southern Hemisphere. You've been in this role as the government negotiator for three years or so? From 2010. And I'm sure there has been a lot of lessons for you. Can you kindly share some of those lessons that might be important for all these peace builders to get back home and help them in their work? And if there was an advice you could give to the young women who might be entering the field here and might be thinking about being a government negotiator, what would that advice be? Government or our group negotiator. <laughs> because some of the members on the other side were not really, as I said, organic members. Some of them were actually that to help them. And they had to make good, clear decisions. Uh, for instance, you know that Attorney Raisa Jajuri, who is uh, one of the most prominent women on there, and uh, is not really organically, uh, but she uh, and I left, but she had to uh, help them. And she took it as a, as a responsibility to play that role. Uh, and she had to, be, to learn the ropes inside the MIA. I mean, it would have been nice if she were here giving us her experience. But you can actually be that to assist the arm group, right? To, <laughs> to play this, kinds of, this kind of role, whether as part of the team that will be negotiating uh, or maybe on an advisory capacity. And when you're called upon, certainly, uh, you have to make clear decisions because that would be playing a different role from the kind of roles that you played before. Uh, to a certain extent, it was necessary to be clear about your role. You cannot be playing different roles all at the same time. You get mixed up and you're, you, you, get, uh, you get people suspecting what your real motives are. Uh, so it was very clear for me for the transition from a uh, civil society peace advocate and academic to, uh, to one representing the government. Uh, sometimes I will be mistaken as a representative of the women's sector and I said, no, I cannot claim to represent the women because I represent the president in this instance, but I'm bringing with me that kind of perspective, my life, uh, life story, my academic training, my uh, studies and research, and that's what I'm bringing here. But it's so easy to say you represent this and that, especially for civil society groups. They always claim to represent <laughs> the multitude. Uh, but uh, So you have to be clear. But at the same time, you know that there are expectations from you. The fact that you're a woman, you're expected to carry the gender agenda. And sometimes you have to explain that it cannot be just, you know, so easily done, and uh, that there would be roundabout ways of doing it as against the maybe what civil society would be more accustomed to, which is really confrontational and straightforward to get what they get what they want. Right? So, so all of these are part of that. Uh, it's hard to capture a single lesson, but in terms of uh, the whole negotiation process, it was really a matter of building, uh, getting the consensus. And working, uh, building on them. You know, our drafts would be flashed on the, and it would be several colors. MILF position, government position. Uh, a yellow highlighted would mean the would reflect the consensus, or a bold text would reflect the consensus. And we built on what we were, and then we will see. We'll be happy. Oh, a lot of uh, a lot of yellow highlighted text that meets only a few items left, and that keeps us you know, inspired to really finish the. Uh, we cannot get stuck on the difficult things. We have to just keep moving forward and uh, build a uh, cumulative uh, consensus on uh, the different findings. Miriam, you have been open and engaging with us this morning, and our time slot at Speaking Peace has come to an end. 
Paolo and I as the host, very much thank you for being an easy person to interview. Thank you for just your willing to be candid and go with the questions that came to you. Speaking Peace today has been on location at the Mentanao Peace Building Institute and uh, we have here the director Chris Fertucci of Mentanao uh, Mentana Peace Building Institute. Um, I invite you to say a thank you also to our guest. Well, on behalf of the, the Institute, on behalf of our participants in 2014, our facilitators, our staff, our volunteers, we are deeply grateful for this contribution, Miriam. I have been inspired, I know we all have been inspired by your sharing, by your openness, and again, the insights. As I reflect on what you said, there were really many gems that I feel that we can take with us hopefully into your classes for your own debriefing. I'm sure that will happen this afternoon. And then also to your home countries and to our communities. And again, here I am, my deepest gratitude for this. Thank you, and for you, you are this busy, busy woman coming here to Davao to be with us. It is an honor and a privilege. Thank you so much. Oh, we have a little token of our appreciation for you. Let me ask Terezi to bring it forward and maybe explain it to all of us. <laughs> Just to give you a very brief background about the box. The box is called Kabai by the Danaon people. Now, the Danaon or people we have the Magindanaons, people of the flooded plain, the Branaos, people of the lake, and the Hiranaons, people who are living stretching from the municipality of Paran to the municipality of Punto. The Branaos the of the lake, they have different sizes of Kabai depending on the purpose of its usage. The size can be a treasure chest where you can keep your precious belongings. This is the very box, the very common was made by the hands of the people of the lake. Miriam, your presence here today has been a treasure to us, one that we will remember for a long time. Uh, so there is a small symbol for you to remember your time here. Yes. <laughs> So thank you, let's give her another round of applause.